All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome back to Statistics for Linguistics. Uh, we're going to talk about not so, uh, necessarily statistics today, uh, but we're actually going to talk about probability, which is a slightly different field of study. Uh, something that is improbable is that today is November 22nd, and uh, it, it's beautiful weather out. I don't know exactly what the temperature is. It's probably like 10 degrees Celsius or better. Uh, so I'm taking advantage by being back out um, on the picnic bench here, and I'm going to record this lecture for you all before the nice weather goes away and we finally get some winter, uh, whenever that might be. Um, and before that happens, we're going to get an opportunity to play Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, and this is a tradition in this class, uh, again, kind of for better or for worse. Um, and let me see if I can find my dice. Uh, I should have broken these out before I got the lecture started, but be that as it may, I think I just found them. Uh, <laughs> I normally, in this class, have some dice rolling time at this point in the semester because normally people are kind of stressed out uh, and it would enjoy playing some games. So um, I have uh, this game which involves these dice, which I bought many, many years ago uh, and found a use for them finally when I started teaching this class. But for this uh, little demo, we need one person to be an orc and another person to be an elf. Normally I can get some volunteers. Usually easier to get somebody to volunteer to be an elf than to be an orc. Uh, yeah, and actually, now that I'm talking about that, <laughs> I will point out I had this little um, sort of sound symbolism insight a while back. Last fall, I was actually reading Lord of the Rings again for like the millionth time, uh, and I was thinking about the word orc uh, and how it's kind of like a phonetic like counterpart to elf. So like a eh is a front mid unrounded vowel, and o is a uh, back mid rounded vowel, and er and l are kind of pair across the liquid spectrum, and then f is a front fricative and then k is a backstop that sort of thing so i think this is my own personal con conspiracy theory but i think tolkien just came up with this word orc as just like the opposite of elf and normally people want to be elves uh in this game usually somebody will jump up and be an orc either way it's just a dice rolling game if you don't know what an orc is i found this picture on the internet they're supposed to look sort of like that in your imagination they're not real don't worry about them um there's not that much of a threat elves are also not real but they're like this idealized warrior or actually kind of sylvan warrior kind of creature. So they don't like each other, elves and orcs, uh, but we're gonna have them do battle in an imaginary world. Um, so the orc will start out with 10 hit points, um, and it, this is a Dungeons and Dragons concept, and I will preface this by saying I've only played Dungeons and Dragons like a few times in my life. It's always been fun, but I've never been one of those like super into it people, um, even though I have many friends who are super into it people. So if you're out there watching this, I see you, uh, but we're just going to play a kind of uh, modified version of this game for probability purposes. So the orc is going to start out with 10 hit points, which is like representative of how much life he has, basically. Uh, and the elf is going to start out with 8 hit points, um, or another way to look at it is like how much damage can you take from your enemy. Uh, and the orc can take a little bit more than the elf. Uh, the orc is going to receive a 12-sided die, which in... The gaming community is called the D12, um, and if you haven't seen one of these before, they're pretty cool. Maybe you can see that pretty well. So it's got 12 sides, uh, and normally I hand these out in class, and you roll them, and run that particular roll, I got a four. Hopefully you can see that. Uh, and also a D8, an eight-sided die, which is pretty cool too. Let's make sure I get the right one. I get the D8s and the D10s confused easily. This is a D8. We can roll it. Uh, we get a one of these, a seven. Uh, yeah, so that's kind of neat if you haven't seen one of those before. Um, I've got pictures here in case you aren't watching the video, um, but that's what they look like in uh, Google graphic land. <laughs> so on each turn, um, the orc is going to roll the d12 first uh, on what we'll call an attack roll. Uh, and then on any roll greater than a six, the elf will be hit by whatever the orc is swinging. Over here, it looks like he's got a gigantic club of some sort. So that's kind of scary. Uh, so if he hits, if he connects with that elf, um, then the orc will roll the d8. And the d8, the number on the d8 will represent the number of hit points out of eight that the elf will do. So up to all of its life, basically, the elf might just disappear on one mighty swing of that mace hammer thingy. Uh, anyways, the elf will receive a d20. I think these are my favorite dice. So, or form of dice, so they're 20-sided. Um, and I just rolled one of these. It's got a dot on the bottom to represent a nine. Uh, and then also a D10, which I was playing around with before. These are kind of cool too, nice shape to them. Nice kind of rounded shape. The one that's on top there is an eight. Uh, none of this matters at the moment, but similarly, the elf will roll an attack roll. We'll roll the D20 first, and on any roll greater than 15, the orc is hit. If it's less than, or 15 or less, and nothing happens to the orc. But if it's greater than that, then the elf will roll the D10. 
and the number on the d10 is the number of hit points out of 10 that the orc will lose. So we will keep fighting this way to the fantasy death. So we will keep rolling until one party or the other, or maybe both in sort of a worst case scenario, will lose all of their hit points. Uh, and then whoever kills off their opponent first wins. Uh, actually, that kind of would prevent both from kill being killed off at the same time. Um, yeah, and in order to do this, I'm actually gonna set up a little uh, spreadsheet. Okay, apologies for that brief interruption, but I had to set up my spreadsheet so we can kind of keep track of the game here. Uh, so I've got just a couple of columns here. One for how many hit points the orc has, another for how many hit points the elf has. Then I'm just gonna keep track of the rolls here, um, how many, like what the roll, orc rolls on its attack rolls. Uh, and then what it rolls on its damage rolls if it gets a successful attack. Uh, and I've got a little footnote there to say that the orc will um, successfully hit the elf on a roll of better than six, and then the elf will hit the orc on a roll of better than 15. Um, and then beyond that, we have damage roll if the elf actually does make contact. And the way we're gonna do this is not through the homepage for the course, but looks, lo and behold, uh, if you can imagine, if you can believe it, uh, the people at Google think about multi-sided dice as well. Go figure. Uh, and they have got this little dice roller set up that you can just like roll um, dice on the internet this way. So we can't do this in reality. Normally it's kind of fun to actually just do something physical in the class uh, because we've been thinking so hard about so many complex situations for so long. But here we're just gonna roll dice virtually. Again, we're doing everything virtually in the world. And I will roll a die for the orc to begin with and we said the orc will get a hit on a roll better than six, uh, but the roll was six only, so no dice, haha, <laughs> there for the orc. Let's roll one for the elf. The elf hits a 20. Uh, in real Dungeons and Dragons, special things would happen in that case, but it's just above 15 in this game, that's all we care about. So now we're gonna roll this d10 and see what the, oh my goodness, the elf took away eight hit points from the orc. So there's only two left for the orc. Isn't this exciting? Who's gonna die first? It's classic drama here in link statistics. Um, the org gets a hit of seven. How many dip hit points will that take away from the elf? It will be four. So now the elf is down to four total. Hmm. Um, yeah, so the elf gets a shot as well. Let's see what happens. Uh, seven, that's no good. It might be a comeback for the orc. Again, if you've played Dungeons and Dragons before and don't find this all exciting, you can skip ahead to the end if you want. We'll see how much damage the orc gets. And it is a six. Oh no, our heroic elf has gotten below zero hit points. The elf is done uh, and will not get another shot um, at the orc. Uh, oh, maybe we can just do it for his sporting sake and see if the elf would have gotten him or not. Nope, eight, sorry, orc wins. Okay, so that's our first battle. We'll save that for safekeeping because we'll want to treasure this moment forever. Uh, anyways, um, that was kind of nonsensical, but you know, war often has no point. So after one battle of this, the, the orc won. So let's add a dwarf to the mix. Let's reincarnate our elf and have the dwarf fighting on the side of the elf like Gimli and Legolas in Lord of the, Lord of the Rings lore. And in this case, we're gonna have to specify what the dwarf's rules are. The dwarf will start out with a total of six hit points. Uh, and we'll receive a d6, which is a die that you're probably used to. I got this from a Dungeons and Dragons set a, a long time ago, so it doesn't have the little pips on it, it just has the numbers. Yeah, uh, so like this is a five, right? Five. Uh, and then also a d4, which to me is the weirdest of these unusual die, dice, dies. Um, yeah, so it looks like that, uh, like a pyramid, right? Um, and then when you roll it, you just take the number on the bottom, so that's a two. Uh, right. Uh, so I don't really like the d4, but it's there. So we'll use it. Um, anyways, uh, the dwarf will roll the d6 for its attack roll and hit the orc on a five or a six, anything better than four. And then the dwarf will roll the d4 for hit points. The orc still has a total of 10 to begin with. Um, and the orc can specify which enemy he or she would like to attack on each roll. Uh, yeah, there's this joke in Lord of the Rings about how you can't tell the male orcs from a, or the male dwarves from a female dwarf. Uh, or vice versa, and they never say anything about the orcs. I feel like it'd be weird um, to think about male versus female orcs. They're presumably out there, who knows? It's a fantasy, what do we care? Let's just roll the dice and see what happens. Um, so we're gonna start out with the orc again, and again, if you don't wanna watch virtual dice rolling, you can skip ahead to the end of this. Um, but we'll see, the, or the orc will attack the dwarf first because the dwarf has less hit points. So that's four, so we're down to two for the dwarf. So. That's a bad start for the good guys. Uh, how about that elf? 
break out that bow leglet. Oh, one. Oh, that's no good. All right, maybe the dwarf can help out. Rolling a d6 here, and the dwarf gets a three. Not a good start for the good guys. We'll go back to the orc. Hopefully you're enjoying this as much as I am. The orc rolls an 11. The orc is just killing it, literally, or figuratively, because we're just imagining this. Oh, the orc takes away the dwarf's other two hit points. Now we just have the orc against the elf again, starting from scratch, more or less. Uh, the elf is still ineffective. Oh well, we'll keep on rolling, see what happens. 10, big double digits for the orc again and again. It's like a superstar in the NBA. So uh, we're down to four hit points for the elf and the elf still gets a swing or a shot or whatever. Still not connecting at all. Hmm, doesn't look good. Maybe there's a comeback in here somewhere too. Okay, that's not good enough. Here's our comeback, right? It's gotta balance out in the end. No, five. Okay, <laughs> this is hopefully reasonably exciting. Um, believe it or not, this has a purpose in the end. The orc hits again and gets hit points again against the elf. Knocks off two more. There's only two left for the elf. Will the elf actually cause some damage before its day is done? No, it's just going to roll very low numbers over and over again. This is, I guess, part of the fun of playing games, but here's two more that the orc needs to get away from the elf, and it does. Negative two. I think the orc went unscathed in that entire sequence, right? No, one one shot there from the elf. Never mind. That was close. I forgot about that part, but this whole battle against two, two is worse than one. So, anyways, that's the game. Uh, in class, it can be a little bit of fun, and I can also get some people to stare at me like, what the heck is this guy doing occasionally as well? But for now, we'll just, that's our game. Um, <laughs> and we can ask, what just happened? Uh, did my professor go crazy or is it just me? Well, okay, this is a silly game, but what principles are at work here? And the reason I'm going to ask these questions is because I think you already know the answers. Uh, intuitively, even if you don't know how to put them into words, uh, there are principles at play here. So let's call our two roles attack and damage roles or event A and event B. I've been calling them attack and damage roles already. So for instance, the first die that the orc would roll, the d12, um, would hit, that was an attack roll, and it would hit on a better than six. And then the orc would roll a d8 for his damage roll, that sort of thing. Um, so we can calculate the probability of certain events happening in this game with two rules, the sum and the product rules. And this is kind of the main point, or two of the main points I want to get across to you in this lecture, is that the, there are these rules of probability at play, and we all kind of intuitively understand how they work. Uh, I want to make explicit what's going on with both of these because it's a little bit like linguistics that you have this knowledge of language but you don't know how to describe your uh, sort of intuitive knowledge or innate knowledge of how your language linguistic system works uh, similarly we kind of have a sense of how probability works but it's hard to put into words until now uh, until today on this warm sunny november afternoon so the sum rule is for mutually exclusive events and the product rule is for independent events. And we apply those two rules in those two mutually exclusive situations. Okay, so let's start off by asking some questions, try to figure out how this system works. So what is the probability that the elf will roll a six on its attack roll? And the elf, you might recall, is rolling this cool looking D20. And I don't just like it because it's black, which is my favorite color, but I like that shape. 14 on that one, still missed. Uh, anyways, what's the probability that the elf will roll a six, if I can find it? If you haven't figured out the answer by now, it might help to think, well, there are 20 sides to this 20-sided die, and six is just one of those sides. So if the die is true, it's a fair die, then you get a one out of 20 probability of rolling a six on that attack roll. Similarly, what about the orc? The orc is rolling a d12. There are 12 sides on that die, so rolling a one. You just have a one out of 12 chance of doing that, right? Uh, and then lastly, what about the dwarf? The dwarf was just rolling a six-sided die, or just a die as we normally know it. It's the unmarked die. Uh, then we just get a one out of six chance, right? Those are easy to think about, right? Um, but uh, you might want to think that, um, you know, rolling a five on a six-sided die can't happen at the same time as rolling a two, so those are mutually exclusive events. Just keep that in mind. Um, question number two, what is the probability that the elf will hit the orc on its attack roll? Uh, and the elf, I don't, 
only got one attack roll, but it was rolling a d10. Uh, so there are 10 sides to that die, and I believe the, uh, oh, sorry, no, the attack roll is a d20. Uh, never mind, the d10 was a damage roll. The d20 was the attack roll. What is the probability the elf will hit the orc on its attack roll? It would only hit on a roll of better than 15, um, so you might be able to think intuitively, well, the probability of that happening is 5 out of 20, or if you want to simplify that a bit, that would be 1 out of 4, right? Um, there are five numbers better than 15 or bigger than 15 on a 20-sided die, so those are your chances, right? And if you hadn't already figured out how you figured that out, I kind of answered that for you, right? Um, but this goes back to some of our basic rules, right? So each one of these outcomes for the d20 is a mutually exclusive event. We can't roll two numbers with this at the same time. We just get one. Um, and so there are five different possible outcomes where the elf will hit the orc. Um, each one of those has an probability of 1 out of 20, and if you add them up because they're mutually exclusive events using that sum rule, you get a total probability of 5 out of 20 that the elf will hit the orc on its attack roll, or it will have a 5 out of 20 probability that it will roll better than 15 with a 20-sided die. Okay, likewise we can think, what is the probability that the dwarf will not hit the orc on its attack roll? Uh, and in this case, the dwarf was attacking with a d6, a six-sided die, and was going to hit on either a five or a six. Um, so it will not hit on any of the numbers from one through four. Uh, so that you can think of the probability of that as either four out of six, or if you want to simplify, that winds up being two out of three. Same sort of situation as we had for the elf. We can answer this question by using the sum rule, which I kind of walked through before I specified on the slide. But the sum rule says... The combined probability of mutually exclusive events occurring is the sum of the probabilities of each of these events. So it might be easier to think in terms of the six-sided die because we're more used to that and also there's less fewer numbers to contend with. But um, the dwarf is not going to hit the orc if it rolls a one, two, three, or four. Each one of those numbers has a one out of six probability of occurring. So the combined probability of those mutually exclusive events occurring is just the sum of all their probabilities. It's one sixth plus one sixth plus one sixth plus one sixth. And I'm realizing as I'm saying this that I shouldn't have used a six sided die except for that forced me to say the word sixth four times, now five times already. But either way, we get one out of six plus one out of six, so on and so forth. Um, and that adds up to four out of six totally. And that you can simplify to two out of three at the end of the day. Uh, Right, that's how the sum rule works. Each one of these die outcomes is mutually exclusive. So we can add up their probabilities if we want to consider the joint probability of them all occurring. Uh, note that the combined probability of all mutually exclusive events occurring is one, which is something that should hopefully be pretty intuitive. So if I roll this die, I will get some number as long as I can keep it on the table. I got a four that time. Hopefully you can see that. Uh, yeah, so each one of those events occurring has a probability of one six uh, and if you add all those up there's six possible different outcomes and that adds up to being one right uh, another way to look at that is if we go back to the probability of the elf hitting the orc we determined that was one out of four but all the other possible mutually exclusive events for this 20-sided die um, the probability of them occurring is three out of four uh, that's basically 15 divided by 20 uh, that's the probability of the elf not hitting the orc you add one fourth plus three fourths, you get one, right? That's the overall probability that encompasses all the different mutually exclusive outcomes in the, these particular cases. Okay, I have more questions. So, what is the probability of the elf not hitting the orc and the orc not hitting the elf on their attack rolls? Um, I'm talking a lot more about the attack rolls here than the damage rolls, but we'll get to the damage rolls again eventually. So, on the attack rolls, the elf uh, is rolling a d20, and the orc is hitting, rolling a uh, d12. Uh, the elf will hit on its attack roll when it rolls better than 15, and the orc will hit on its attack roll if it's hitting uh, better than 6. Uh, so that means that the probability of the elf not hitting the orc is going to be 3 fourths, and the orc, the probability of the orc not hitting the elf is going to be 1 half. So this is any roll of up to 15 for the elf, 15 out of 20. There's going to be any roll up to 6 out of 12 for the orc. You can simplify those both to 3 fourths and 1 half. 
multiply them together, you get three eighths. So that's the overall probability of these two events happening. And at this point, we're using uh, a couple of different rules, but we're, so we are using the sum rule to calculate these individual probabilities for um, the two separate attack rolls. But because they're separate, we can all of a sudden use the product rule to figure out what their joint probability of happening might be. Um, so the elf, the elf's attack roll is a separate event from the orc's attack roll, um, and their whatever happens on those two uh, attack rolls is independent of each other. That means we use the product rule to figure out what their joint probability would be. Um, again, if you haven't already figured out how you figured that out, that's how you figure it out. <laughs> uh, so. We can also kind of apply the same principle to another example. What is the probability of both the elf and the dwarf hitting the orc on the same turn on their attack rolls? Um, yeah, so we've talked about the elf rolling a d20. We've also talked a little bit about the dwarf rolling a d6 on its attack roll. Um, the probability of the elf getting hit is 1 out of 4. The probability of the dwarf getting hit is 1 out of 3. Um, to figure out the probability of both those things happening at the same time, uh, you just multiply the probabilities. One fourth times one third equals one twelfth. Maybe this is why it never happened. It's not a hugely likely outcome uh, of this rolling game. Uh, so the operative rule here is the product rule. Uh, I've kind of talked you through it a little bit already, but what it says specifically is that when two events are independent, the probability of them both occurring is the product of their individual probabilities. And yeah, I think generally speaking, we can kind of figure this out intuitively without explicitly making these rules explicit. Uh, but in case you're not sure, that's what the rule says. Uh, and that captures our intuitions about how this works. So uh, for instance, an elf rolling a three and an orc rolling a two are two independent events. In that case, if you wanted to figure out the joint probability of them both happening, you'd use the product rule. Um, and this would, so I mean, I'm not specifying what kind of role here, but if you want to figure out what's the probability of the elf rolling a three on its attack roll and the orc rolling a two on its attack roll, uh, well then, whatever, this is one out of 20 and this is one out of 12. So you get a very large number in that particular case. I think it'd be like one out of 240, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so that particular combination of events would be small because you use the product rule. Um, however, on the other uh, hand, if an elf uh, is rolling its attack rolls. An elf cannot roll a three and a two at the same time. Those are mutually exclusive outcomes. So you use the sum rule, and there, uh, you know, your probabilities add up rather than getting smaller and smaller, as it tends to be the case with the product rule. So these are independent events, two separate rolls by two separate creatures, or possibly two separate students in the class, uh, and these are mutually exclusive outcomes, um, like that just pertain to different numbers on the same die. Uh, so in that case, you use the sum rule. Okay, let's sum up everything we've learned so far with one more Dungeons and Dragons question. And it's kind of a bigger one than we've tackled before, but on any given turn, we have three creatures taking swings at each other, an orc, an elf, and a dwarf. What is the probability that on each turn, we will get zero hits, one hit, two hits, or three hits? Uh, so it's possible that all these creatures could miss. I think we had at least one turn like that. Possible, possible they could all hit each other. I don't think we had any turns like that. Or they could get just one hit total or two hits total. How can we figure out the probability of those different outcomes of these turns? Okay, I'll walk you through it. Uh, and normally in class, this is the point at which I just pause and say, why don't you figure this out? So I'll give you a moment to kind of figure it out. It's still a nice day, I'm still happy about that. Anyways, um, we can calculate the probability of hits like this um, basically, you need to calculate the individual probabilities of each creature missing. So the probability that a dwarf will miss on its attack roll is 2 out of 3, and you roll up to 4 on this guy. The probability of elf missing is 3 out of 4, and you roll up to 15 on this guy. And the probability of the orc missing is 1 out of 2, which is any roll up to 6 on this guy. So those um, you, probabilities you can calculate using the sum rule just kind of within considering the op, um, possible outcomes within each die. But since those are three mutually or three independent events, sorry, got to be careful. These are all three independent events. If we want to calculate their joint probability occurring, we multiply these probabilities by each other. So the probability that all three creatures will miss is two out of three um, times three out of four times one out of two. 
uh, if you do the arithmetic there, we got two times three on the top end, and we got three times four times two on the bottom end. It's six out of 24, which you can simplify to one fourth. Uh, so I can't remember how many different um, times that happened to us. Uh, maybe none. Um, yeah, because people died off too quickly, but there's one out of four chance of that happening in this sort of game. Um, so I tried to structure it so it wouldn't be too boring because everybody missing is kind of a boring outcome. All right, moving on to the next possible outcome, one hit. Um, we actually get one hit in three different ways, right? So maybe only the dwarf hits, maybe only the elf hits, and maybe only the orc hits. Uh, at this point, hopefully you can see my notation of a plus means a hit and a negative sign means a miss. And then D, E, and O represent the dwarf, elf, and orc. For this possibility, we're just gonna have to calculate the probability of each of these happening independently. So uh, the dwarf hitting is a one out of three possibility. And if the dwarf is hitting in this case, then we're considering cases where the elf and the orc are missing. So it's one third times three fourths, the elf missing, and then one half, which is the probability of the orc missing. So multiply those all up together because they're independent events. We get three out of 24, one third times three fourths times one half, and that simplifies to one eighth. Okay, likewise, maybe only the elf gets a hit. That means the dwarf misses and the orc misses as well. So we have a two-thirds probability of this first event, a one-fourth probability of the second event, and one-half for the orc. Everything here is just going to be one-half for the orc, it turns out, but um, to split right down the middle. That uh, you multiply those probabilities occurring because these are all independent events again. You get an overall probability of 2 out of 24, or 1 12th. And for the last option with the orc hitting, um, you just have the probabilities of the dwarf missing times the probabilities of the elf missing times the probability of the orc hitting. You get two thirds times three fourths times one half equals six out of 24 or one fourth. Uh, so maybe this is why the orc one <laughs> has a uh, kind of better probability of hitting uh, than the other two creatures do. Uh, so that worked in its favor. Um, violent society, those orcs. Anyways, <laughs> there are three, these are three mutually exclusive events. So we can use the sum rule to add their probabilities together. Um, yeah, so each of these roles by the dwarf, elf, and orc are independent events. That's why we're multiplying their probabilities together. Uh, but the first case where only the dwarf gets a hit uh, is mutually exclusive from these other two, where only the elf gets a hit or only the orc gets a hit. So the overall probability is gonna be the addition of all these numbers together. Um, and hopefully you can see uh, three plus two plus six is 11 on the top end of this uh, divided by 24. So overall, the probability of just one hit is 11 out of 24. Uh, I'm talking quite a bit here for a lot of the numbers on these slides. Uh, hopefully you can see this relatively quickly because um, I don't wanna talk quite as much for the last two possibilities, but I'll just show you how the math works out. There are three different ways to get two hits as well, right? So in this case, it's like only one creature is missing. So you just change which creature is missing on each um, for each possibility. So if the orc misses and the other two get a hit, uh, we multiply those probabilities together, get together, we get one out of 24. That's not likely. Uh, lucky for the orc. If only the elf misses and the dwarf and the orc get a hit, uh, then we multiply those probabilities together, we get three out of 24 or one eighth. Uh, and then the last possibility is that only the dwarf will miss. Um, and then the elf and orc get hits, uh, and the probability of that happening is one twelfth. Um, yeah, or two out of 24. So again, to get the overall probability of these things happening, we'd have to add these all together because they're mutually exclusive events. So we just add those together to get six out of 24 or one fourth. Okay, last but not least, there's also one possibility of getting three hits, which is everybody gets hit. So you just multiply the individual probabilities of those happening and you get one third times one fourth times one half and that equals one out of 24. So there's a reason we didn't see that happening, uh, you know, because it's not that likely and we didn't roll the dice that many times, no matter what it might have seemed like at the beginning of this lecture. Okay, now we can see the entire distribution, right? So the probability of zero hits is six out of 24. The probability of one hit is 11 out of 24. The probability of two hits is six out of 24. And then lastly, we got that one little slice for three hits. You might notice that if you add up the numbers in the numerators of all these fractions, they add up to 24, right? They're mutually exclusive events. Their overall probability of all of them happening is gonna be one. 24 out of 24. So 6 plus 11 plus 6 plus 1 is 24. 24 divided by 24 is 1. 
if we plot these guys in a sort of histogram-like distribution, this is what their probabilities will look like. Uh, this is 6 out of 24 here. It converts to 0.25 or 1 quarter on this graph. And then this is 11 out of 24, almost a half, so on and so forth. Then we get this little bar here down at the end for three hits. So that kind of looks a little bit normally or like something like a normal distribution is starting to emerge out of this. Uh, but that's the distribution for this funny little game that we put together. Okay. And we've used the sum and product rules to answer a more complicated question to generate this sort of distribution. So we're moving right along. Um, yeah, so I will add on here that once you figure out three of these pro uh, possibilities, like there's four different possible outcomes here, if you figure out the probability for three of them, you can figure out the fourth by just subtracting the other three from one, which, as I mentioned before, is the total probability of all of the mutually exclusive events happening. So, for instance, if you didn't already know what the probability of two hits was, um, then you could take one and subtract from it the probability of zero hits, the probability of one hit, and the probability of three hits to get one minus six twenty-fourths, minus eleven twenty-fourths, minus one twenty-fourths, and that winds up being six twenty-fourths, which we already knew, but we've come at it a different way, right? Um, again, overall, the total probability of all mutually exclusive events happening is going to be one, and you can use that to your advantage. Okay, uh, let's play another game. And for this, uh, we don't play Dungeons and Dragons, so I'm going to put my dice away. Uh, and instead, I'm going to get the implements of fun from another game that I like to play, which is Scrabble. Uh, so normally, I have this little bag of Scrabble tiles here, and normally I would um, kind of simplify the t tiles in it and um, hand it out to students in the class. Luckily for me, I drew an E, but if you're a Scrabble player, you know the most common letter in that bag is an E, so that's not too much of a surprise. Uh, and in this case, uh, what, I'm gonna, what I normally do is I place five Scrabble tiles in a bag and I place just the vowels in the bag. Uh, and each tile has a different vowel letter written on it. You know these probably from a long time ago, A, E, I, O, and U. Uh, I'm not going to actually pull these out of a Scrabble bag, and I didn't, I didn't poke around to see if Google has a Scrabble tile selector on its website or not. It probably does, I don't know. Uh, but I didn't want to use it either way because I just want to have these vowel tiles. So I made one of my own, which is a lot less pretty than the one that Google presents to the world. Uh, and either way, uh, we can start out not by drawing any tiles, which we will eventually. Uh, but let's stop by thinking we got five vowels, a, E, I, O, and U. How many different orders of those five tiles is possible? Hmm. Maybe you already know the answer to this one. Um, I think usually somebody in class comes up with it. Uh, but one way to figure out the answer is to use um, a special notation uh, that you might have encountered in math class a while back, which is this factorial notation. So if you write this as five with an exclamation mark next to it, that's called five factorial. And what that means is that you're just going to take five and multiply it by each number in decreasing order from five until you get down to one. So uh, five times four times three times two times one equals 120. Uh, that's how many different orders of the five tiles is possible. Um, and another way to think about it is, say, if you're just selecting tiles out of a bag with five vowels in it, uh, on the first selection, you could pick any one of these five. So that gives you five options here. Once you've picked it, there's only four left. So you pick one of those, and there's four options of what you can get there. So those are those are independent events again. Or, yeah, I don't want to quite say that that way. But um, there's five options for the first one, four options for the second draw, three options for the third draw, two for the sec or fourth, and then just one left over for the final one. Uh, so if you multiply all of those options together, you're going to get 120 different possible orders. OK, each one of those different orders is, is known as a permutation. So we can put these vowels in 120 different orders, just those five. Um, and I've got this little commentary down here at the bottom about the factorial notation, in case um, you're not familiar with that. But that's basically what it means. Uh, its name is factorial. And then if you put it after a number, it just means take that number and multiply it by each of the numbers in decreasing order down to 1. The reason we have that notation is because it, it enables us to solve problems like this in a nice shorthanded manner, right? Uh, we can just represent this quantity quite quickly by saying it's 5 factorial. OK, now I need a volunteer to select three tiles out of the bag. 
And this is something I'm going to do virtually again. Hopefully I didn't kill myself off here. All right, uh, yeah, so I uh, didn't want to do this uh, before it was time to do it. So uh, let's just erase what I did before. So I've got this little Perl script here um, called scrabble1.perl. Uh, and I'm going to say, how many letters do I want? It's got five vowels in its virtual bag. If I pick one, I get a U. For some reason, I keep getting U's a lot. I don't know. Yeah. I don't want you to pick just one out of this bag. I want you to pick three. And in this case, I'm going to get E-A-U. How about that? We happen to get the French word for water. It's fundamental somehow. Um, isn't it great to live in Canada? Anyway, so these are our three letters, E, A, and U. Uh, and I've got um, this question about how many different orders of those three tiles is possible. It turns out, once again, that's three factorial. Same answer as what we saw before. So we get six different possible orders of those three tiles. We can start out there. We can also ask another question, and in fact I will, which is what is the probability that you would draw those three particular tiles out of the bag in any order? So we have the five vowel letters in that bag, and we picked out E, A, and U. Um, and I want you to kind of think about this question for a little bit um, because it's a tougher question, but I think you can figure out the answer. Uh, and I will say that in reviewing these notes and actually putting together this PowerPoint, um, you know, I stopped and I was like, oh, what is the answer to that? And I was like, well, it's one out of five for the E, and then it's, you know, one out of four for the A, and then it's one out of three for the U. So those are, you know, independent events. I just multiply all those probabilities together and I get one out of five times one out of four times one out of three. It's like one out of whatever, one out of 60. Um, and then I realized I was wrong. Not because I had some great intuitive insight, but because I looked at my notes again, and I was like, wait, <laughs> that's not gonna work. Why doesn't that work? Uh, it's because of this little footnote I have about in any order. So in that specific order, E-A-U, it's not super likely, right? Uh, it's just a one out of 60 chance that we would have drawn the French word for water out of the bag. Uh, instead, um, on the first draw, the probability of choosing any one of those three tiles is three out of five. And on the second draw, we only have two of the tiles we're looking for in the bag, and there's only four total. So our probability uh, on the second draw is two out of four. And then on the third draw, we just have one out of three, right? Hopefully you can see how that works. You're just kind of decreasing uh, the numbers on both sides of that fraction. Uh, then to get the overall probability, we just multiply each of these three, the probability of each of these three events happening by each other, and we get three out of five times two out of four times one out of three, and we don't get, at the end, we don't get one out of 60, we get six out of 60, which if you want to, you can simplify to one out of 10. So drawing E, A, and U in any order out of the bag, there's one out of 10 probability we would have gotten those three letters. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. Again, I think it's kind of intuitive, it's just that your mind can kind of rush to incorrect uh, conclusions if you just, aren't thinking about this too deeply, like I was a day or two ago. Okay, another way to think about this is probably a way you wouldn't intuitively think about, um, but I'm gonna show it to you because it's gonna be sort of the way the math works out um, for probability. But let's say we have um, five tiles, and that means that we have 120 different possible ways in which they could be ordered, 100 different permutations that they can be ordered in. That's five factorial. Um, for each unique set of the first three tiles, thinking of these 120 different orders, how many different orders or permutations of the last two tiles are there? So let's say we have the letters E, A, and U in our first three slots. What's left over for the last two slots? Well, we just have I and O, right? Input, output, maybe. Uh, so it can go in how many different orders for those last two tiles? Well. It's either I-O or it's O-I, right? There's just two different orders left uh, at the tail end. Um, so we already know that for the first three, there are six possible orders. And for the last two, there are two possible orders. Um, so we've walked through that as well. And then for that sort of setup, uh, for any given set of the initial three tiles, we can get six possible orders for the first three and two possible orders for the last two and that means you can get a total of 12 possible orders for each unique set of the first three tiles six times two and hopefully that makes sense um, but again this just kind of we're going to keep 
this first set of three consistent um, in being the first three, and then the last set of two will also be consistent in being the last two. Uh, and then just we can possibly order the tiles 12 different ways if those first three tiles remain consistent, but not necessarily in the same order, right? So we have 12 different possibilities in that situation. We also have 120 different possible orders altogether. How many unique sets of the first three tiles are there then? Um, it's going to wind up being 10. Uh, so there's 120 possible orders altogether. For each unique set of the first three tiles, we get 12 of those. So that means there can be 10 different possible orders or 10 different sets of those first three tiles. Uh, that, like I said, is not sort of a normal way you'd probably think about this, but it's still true. It still works. Um, and if you can wrap your head around how to get there, um, it's going to be helpful because, like I said, that's kind of how the math is going to be expressed um, for what we're going to next. So uh, if we have 10 different possible unique sets of the first three tiles, then the probability of drawing any one of those unique sets of three tiles out of the bag is going to be 1 out of 10, or 0.1. Um, and we saw that before in kind of the simpler way, uh, which is by calculating like this, um, just uh, multiplying the probabilities of the individual draws, uh, first three draws by each other. We get 6 out of 60, or 1 out of 10. Okay, so hopefully your brain has been stretched, but not too far out of shape because we just have a little bit further to go with this one. Um, so thankfully for us, there's a mathematical function which can do all this work for us, and it's called the choose function, which you may also be familiar with from back in the day of high school math or wherever. Uh, so if you're not, though, I'll show you what it looks like and how it works. So uh, it's kind of funny because it looks like it wants to be a fraction, but it's not. It's just you put in parentheses n over r. That's the sort of default or most general form of this function. Uh, and you can read this as n choose r. So basically it's saying uh, if you have n items in a set and you're choosing r items out of that set, you can use this function. So n choose r equals n factorial divided by r factorial times n minus r factorial, uh, where you're choosing r elements out of a set of n. And the um, sort of parallel, or the example I was just walking you through, um, is directly applicable to this sort of setup. So we had 5 choose 3 in our example. So we're choosing three different tiles out of 5. 5 choose 3 is going to equal 5 factorial divided by 3 factorial. You can think of these are like the first three tiles that we selected out of the bag times n minus r factorial. And this is 5 minus 3, or 2 factorial. So these are the first three tiles we selected out of the bag. These are the last two tiles that would remain in the bag. Um, overall, we'd get, in that case, 5 factorial divided by 3 factorial times 2 factorial. is 120 divided by 6 times 2, or it winds up being 10. We've seen that before already. Um, OK, uh, and if you're. Uh, I've got this note here about R will choose for you, and I didn't actually put this in a note, so I think I'll add it. Uh, so I'll give you an example here um, that I'll show you in R as well. But you can get this function to work in R. Maybe I already did. Yeah, choose 5, 3, and that gives you 10. And ignore this because it doesn't work. Uh, so the n, n number has to be bigger, or at least the same size as um, the R number for this to make sense. In that case, it would be just one if they were equal. Uh, yeah, it's a very simple function, though, to use in R. Uh, so use it. Use it or choose it. Choose it or lose it, I guess. Uh, all right, that's the worst bad, that's the worst dad joke I made yet. Uh, anyways, we got um, just a little way to go here, uh, and then we'll take a break. But let's say uh, we make our setup more complicated, our Scrabble tile setup uh, more complicated by adding a couple of consonant tiles to the mix. And normally I do this in class as well, but uh, for virtual reality's sake, we'll say that we're going to add an S and a T to the mix. So those are just two very common consonants, not necessarily in Scrabble, but in you know real life in English they are. Uh, so once again, what I would normally do is have a volunteer pick four of the seven tiles and then tell me what the probability is of choosing those four tiles regardless of order. And this is just an example for how the choose function works. Uh, but this would be a case of seven choose four. Um, and I'm actually going to show you just for whatever uh, reason that I built a function like this in Perl 2. So 
uh, we're gonna select four tiles out of the bag and we get a T O T I U. I don't think that means anything in English or French that I know of, but yeah, that's what we got. It doesn't matter, they're just random tiles, random letters in order. The way we figure out what the probability is of choosing those four tiles, O, T, I, and U, is we use this choose function. Um, and it turns out it's seven, fact seven choose four equals seven factorial divided by four factorial times seven minus four factorial. Uh, so on the top, we get seven factorial, which is seven times six times five times four times three times two times one. Times one divided by four times three times two times one times one, multiplied by three times two times one. So as you might be able to see, uh, normally it's easier to do this on a chalkboard or a whiteboard, but some of these numbers are just gonna cancel each other out. So you can cancel three times two times one out. Um, that three factorial gets figured out um, on both sides of this fraction. Uh, and then this four here that's left over on the top is gonna cancel out that four. So you wind up with seven times six times five on the top divided by three times two times one. Okay, so uh, seven times six times five is gonna be a fairly big number. We, we can actually simplify that a little bit further by saying that six equals three times two. So we can cancel out the six there and we cancel out the three times the two. We just get seven times five or 35. Hopefully that multiplication isn't too overwhelming. Uh, anyways, this means there are 35 possible different sets of initial four tiles in the bag uh, and the probability therefore of choosing this, the four tiles that we got in any order is going to be one out of 35 um, whatever that happens to be in decimals I don't know uh, right so there are 35 possible unique sets of four tiles we can draw from the seven in the bag the probability of getting any one of them is one out of 35 that's how the choose function works okay the moral of the story for now is the sum of the product rules along with the choose function are all that we need to know about, about probability. And like I said, I think a lot of this is intuitive. Maybe the explicit like functionality of the choose function or what have you might be new to you uh, or factorials or whatever, but it's not too hard to wrap your head around. So hopefully it all makes sense. And if it doesn't, go back and look at the notes again or watch this video again uh, until it does because we're gonna build on this next time as we keep moving forward into probability. But for now, we're done. So enjoy the rest of your afternoon.